Hi, um, my name is Diane Robson. I'm the Games and Education Librarian at the University of North Texas. And with me is Stuart Heath, and he is the Outreach and Events Manager. And um, today we'll be talking about building educational and social communities and academic libraries with game collections. So a long title, we'll be helping you figure out how to start a collection from scratch, how to speak to your administration and things like that in here. So let me get started. So today the overview is we're gonna plan a new collection. And we'll go over just a few sort of hints and tips for that. Selecting and circulating games, engagement and encouraging play and outreach and networking. So before you start thinking about your collection, you'll want to think about the game statistics around it. We all know that people love playing games and there are lots of statistics out there for games, but sort of going out and looking at them and deciding what you want to relay back to administration or back to any stakeholders is good before you start the process. So there are a lot of great stats on the Entertainment Software Association website. They're gonna have stats for just general play across America. They're gonna have industry stats and they're gonna have sort of some university stats and how games are being taught in universities. Um, there's not as much of that out there yet. Um, people are playing, people are playing, about 155 million people are playing across America. And a lot of these people are in their 30s. They're not all little kids and they're not really young. Um, games have been around a really long time if you think about it. And a lot of us have been playing them for a long time. And there are a lot of women that are gaming. And uh, we're considering games to be any sort of play in games, any sort of organized play with an outcome or a goal in mind. So when we're talking about gamers, it is pretty broad and everyone can fit into that easily. Um, the video game industry is continuing to grow. It has not decreased at all, even with uh, the pandemic and things around that. Um, and the tabletop industry is also really robust. It's hard to find as many stats about tabletop games, but you will be able to find stats showing that the industry is growing. Hobby games, a lot of role-playing games are becoming hugely popular again. So go out and look around, find what you think will help you promote this sort of collection to your administration and any stakeholders before you start making some plans. So when you're planning a new collection, there are some things to think about. Why are you starting your collection? And it can be lots of reasons, um, but you wanna think about how you're talking about that collection when you're speaking to people um, that are stakeholders and have, have some sort of, um, say so over your collection. So games are great, they're fun. We love to play them and we can play them with our friends. So there really is an easy way to say it, but you want to talk about it in a, a broader sort of way to, to sort of show how games really do belong in libraries. And they do have a cultural significance. And we see that every day with our mass media. Games are everywhere. There's movies about games, there's books about games. So games are a part of our life, just like any sort of mass media and public libraries and libraries should be collecting those sorts of cultural artifacts. That's what they are. So having a collection belongs in a library. Um, what support do you have? So you wanna think about the support you're gonna need as you talk about your collection to anyone. The support um, you have is a big it's a big deal as you're starting your collection. You wanna make sure that you do have some support and you wanna be able to talk about how you'll need that support and ways to help, help people support you as you start a collection. How you'll catalog, circulate, and assess a collection. Right now, because so many people are starting collections, there, there's more information out there. So we'll talk a little bit about that and then you can go off to some other sites and see what other people are doing that might be more specific to your needs. And then how to promote the collection because you don't want it to just sit there and gather dust. You want people to, to come and play it. So why are you starting a collection? So games are fun, they're great. We love to play with our friends, but they have cultural significance. So you want to be sure they're represented in the libraries. So you can see, how you want to speak about your games. When I first started our collection, I mean, we were great. We had administrative support. People were um, into it, but I was always like, games are fun. And then I talked to another professor and he was like, you really need to think about how you're speaking about games if you really want to have a broader um, appeal across the campus of, of their value in, in an academic environment. And it really did make me stop and think about all the sort of ways that games do help people in lots of ways. So. I've listed a few here. Games can increase engagement and experiential learning. There are lots of games. They're not all, um, you're gonna learn a lot of skills with games. So um, they do help with experiential learning, which means you're learning through play. So you learn how to think critically as you're losing a game horribly to someone and you're watching a great player beat you 
but you're picking up their skills and you're learning how they're thinking about um, resource management and different things like that. So you really are learning critical thinking. You're learning how to tell a spin a story. If you're playing a role playing game, you're learning how to be a storyteller and, and write stories. And you're learning how to develop characters. Or you're learning how to world build and you're doing all these things. Or you may just be playing a simple math game and learning how to add, um, which I probably need to learn how to do a little better. Um, games connect hard skills and soft skills. So you are learning critical thinking skills. You're learning some math, maybe. You're learning uh, all sorts of like skills that you might with chess and just a lot of the just abstract theory games and abstract strategy games. But you're also going to learn soft skills, which is just being with people, um, playing with people, being nice to people, being empathetic with people in a competitive environment and, and having fun. Um, as you play those games. So games are a great way to sort of teach those skills that some of us may be away from as we're in our more digital environments. Tabletop games are a great way to do that. So again, how do you talk about your collection? So here I've given our, given our elevator speech that we wrote a few years ago in our collection goals. And these are available on our library guide that I'll share later, so you don't need to try to write them down. Um, we found that it's just knowing like, three lines that describe your collection. So if someone says, what, how, tell me about your collection. Why would you have it? That you have those three lines to tell anyone. And it might be your boss. It might be your dean of your library. It might be the mayor. It might be the president of your university. You want to be able to give three lines of why that collection should exist and why it's great and what it offers. Um, so don't overthink it. You want everything to be concisely vague. <laughs> so we, we don't, you don't want to put yourself in a box. Don't be too ambitious of your end goals in, in these sorts of um, materials. You know what you want to do. It's sort of cool what you want to collect, but you really will be limited some years by budget, some years by stakeholders, some years by technology knowledge that's available in your library. So just broadly understand what you want and then still reach for those goals, but you don't need to like write them down, you know, into stone. So they're hard, hard to meet or hard to change. Um, but, but these are our goals um, to support student and faculty research, enhance student collaboration and success with games and gaming, increase collaboration across the campus community, and establish a third place to learn, connect with one another. Um, and both of all of them are broad and they allow us to do so much under those umbrellas. Stakeholders. Stakeholders are really important in that they are gonna sort of guide you in what you're able to purchase and what you're able to do. So think about how, how does this collection affect purchasing? How does it affect cataloging, processing, sex management, circulation, information technology, and outreach? All of them will be affected a little bit in how you do your collection and what you decide to collect. Um, I'll cover each one of these and we can look at some of the things that, that go under each stakeholder. Um, game collections are different. They're not difficult. So as we've started, we did so many things to to sort of mitigate what we thought would go wrong. And I think we made it harder on ourselves. They're not difficult collections to own, to house, to circulate. They're just different because they're realia, they're 3D items, they're bigger items, they have lots of pieces, but all of those things are doable and, and achievable. So don't um, sell yourself short as you start to reach out and talk to these groups. Um, there are ways to do it and there's a lot of people already heading down a path that's more easily followed now than it was 10 or 12 years ago. So you have to think about what are you gonna collect? What's gonna be in your game collection? So we're gonna talk about the collection, the cataloging, the circulation, and the assessment in this next section. So again, they're different, not difficult to collect. So tabletop game collections. So if you are brand new and you don't have a lot of support from stakeholders, a tabletop collection is a great way to start. There's no real IT needs. Um, some of the games that do require Steam or something to play, most people are able to play it on their phones. So you don't really need to have a lot of tech buy-in for a tabletop collection. You're not gonna need to do a lot to um, make this happen, except maybe stacks management. Um, they do take up a little more space than books. So just make sure that you do have a way to, to store items. We have closed stacks, which makes it a little easier, but people are um, collecting board games and doing things with their board games with open stacks. So you wanna collect with engagement in mind. And I would consider what you like to play. You're gonna to have to facilitate the games. So make sure there are things that you wanna facilitate, but don't stay in your box. 
make sure you're, you're learning new things as you go along so you can facilitate more types of games. You want to think about the classic games, but you also want to think of what's coming out that's really popular. And there's cooperative games, competitive games, single player games. So just look across the spectrum. And some of the groups I'll link you later will have really good lists of games to buy. And there's a huge helpful community to help guide you as you determine what you might need. Um, quick and easy to play dexterity games are so much fun for facilitating an event. You don't really have to learn much and you can just sort of do this sort of icebreaker, um, getting to know students. There's no sort of involvement in, um, except to just have fun quickly. So people can sort of break the ice and get to know, know one, uh, one another with those sorts of games. So you really wanna make sure you have a good spectrum of games across that. A video collection, a video game collection with consoles. There's medium technology needs here. We are still sort of able to play non-networked offline. I think you, there might be some pushback because so many things are going into the cloud, but you're still able to buy consoles, buy physical content, video games, and still have that work in your library with console stations. Um, moving, moving into the cloud, allowing access to the cloud requires more technology and probably some buy-in from your um, tech department, but those things are managed. You can lock consoles down to, to ports. There are things that you can do to make it work. So. They're probably getting a little console collection and circulating a collection is doable. Um, there's a new generation every three to five years of consoles and it's up to each library how they wanna support that and what they wanna do. Um, so, but they are really, really fun ways to engage with your patrons to have play some silly fun games on consoles and then to allow them to play the things they would like to play. Um, facilitate games, you can engage new players. We see it in our space, people walk up, you wanna play with me, let's play together. Um, Let's all die horribly and overcooked and never be able to make our sushi. You know, let's have some fun. Buy some classics, buy some newer games. Um, you can buy emulators, which is fun. So you can play a lot of really old content on emulators. Emulators are really fairly cheap. So it's a good way to sort of bring in, bring in your childhood into your library and play with some emulators. And again, there's cooperative games, competitive games, single player games. So just make sure you're looking across a spectrum of games to purchase. So you're representing not just you, what you want to play, but what your patrons want to play. And then things, new things, new things for them to look at and to, to experience. A video game collection for PC. This is much harder right now. They have higher cost of technology needs. Um, most libraries already have PCs. They probably will play some games. Um, they may not play some of the, the higher end um, tech need games, like Overwatch may run at a crawl on a just a regular searching PC, but some games could play on the PC if you already have in your library. There's a there is a cost need. If you buy a great computer to start with, you it'll last you three to five years, maybe a little longer. Um, I think we're seeing some of the graphic cards last a little longer than they used to, because um, they're just all so good now. Um, you might you'll need an online account. There are not a lot of library licenses for this, but students in our university are fine playing on their own. Steam accounts, playing with their own accounts, and we're able to offer just the sort of base platform account for them. Um, the licensing issues is something a lot of librarians that are collecting games are gonna need to talk about, just like we did for video 20 years ago, we need to figure out how are we gonna have digital content available for libraries. Um, but I think it's, it's something that we can do, and we can get across that little hurdle that we have for PC games. We have a lot of people engaging across our PC games and having fun and playing together. And, it's again, a very fun space for people to be in. Um, you wanna, you'll want to, if you do offer PC games, offer peripherals, headphones, accessibility devices, all of these things are none, none of these things are more expensive than the PC itself. So if you are gonna do PCs, think about people that do need an accessibility device or headphone and the cables and remotes to make it a fun, fun thing to play. And then space, like the consoles and PCs within your space are really, fun ways to get people engaged and to make that third space that, that uh, Sturt's gonna talk about later. So that's our PC collection. It did take, did take some doing. We had a tiny one to start and then we had such a good go with it that we ended up getting funding for a bigger space. And that's a great way to start small, make it great, and then people will pay to let you get a little bigger. And then escape rooms and breakouts. So we love our escape rooms and breakouts. They can be as minimal a requirement or as huge a requirement as you want. Um, breakout EDU is a, 
a program that you can buy into for about, I think, $100 a year, but they offer a lot of educational breakouts. And we have um, found them as to being helpful for uh, educational, and we modify them to, to do fun things around holidays, and students come in and they'll play, play these breakouts, and there's digital breakouts, and there's also physical breakouts that you could just print out and set up. So there's probably a buy-in to breakout EDU of probably $200, and then a yearly subscription to their site if you wish to do that. But they're a lot of fun. They really get people playing together in breakouts. And then once you feel comfortable running little tabletop breakouts, you can start doing escape rooms, which we have a lot of fun doing our escape rooms. But they do take buy-in. You have to have a space to do them in. You clear out an office and, and play them in that space. But there, if you have people that are on your staff that are creative and like to create things and design puzzles, it really is a good sort of um, cooperative experience in your staff. And then when you get people in there to play together, it's hugely fun, cooperative, critical thinking way to get people together. And we've watched people from across our library play in the escape rooms. We watch departments come in and do team building in our escape rooms. And it's a lot of fun. And I think we, we learn a lot. Like we have a library literacy escape room and we learn so much about how our students think in these escape rooms. So I would suggest doing some sort of once you get comfortable with other game collections, looking at escape rooms and breakouts is something to add on to that. Because I think it's a nice little niche for that. Nice little thing to add on to your, to your gaming is, is people that like that sort of cooperative play. OK, cataloging and processing. So catalog your items. I want to say, please catalog your items. We don't want your collection to be hidden. Because this type of collection, if you buy it, you want people to use it. You don't want someone to say, oh, we bought that and nobody used it. And that's what happens if it's not in the catalog. So you want that record in the catalog. You want people seeing it. You want it to be shiny and sparkly. And here's, here's our collection. So catalog it. And it's much easier to do now. Um, board games weren't, there weren't as many board games in OCLC to start with. But now there are more and more records. But board games, video game records are already in there. It's very rare that you would have to original catalog some of the more popular content. So do not let cataloging be something that slows you down. All of that is, is in there. Consoles are in there. You will find what you need in OCLC for your collection. Um, sometimes, if you don't, there will be someone that can throw that in there for you. Processing. So again, processing is a huge in people's minds, I think a huge stumbling block, but it doesn't have to be. Um, don't overthink it. We actually did a research project where we processed an item with just a single barcode on the front and the pieces bagged. And you can see that in the picture here. And that's how most games come. They'll come with bags um, and you can put your pieces in there. When we didn't put bags in there, our patrons put bags and packed our pieces for us. And then um, we circulated that. And then we also did a board game where we labeled everything, we barcoded everything and we counted everything and we put UNT on all the pieces and we didn't really have any greater loss from the one that was not processed that much. So it, it showed that it's not necessary to overthink the processing for your circulation. Um, just do, do a simple processing. Board games are $50, books are $50. And it's just breaking from that mindset of it being um, so different that it needs to be treated differently. And a lot of people starting board game collections have their own collections. So it's not your personal collection. You have to sort of break the idea that it's yours. It'll circulate like a book. If a book is damaged, we replace it. If a board game's damaged, we replace it. So sort of thinking it as something that's just as easy to handle as a book. Um, looking at lost pieces and when things come back, we weigh our games with a, um, a scale, a mail scale, which is listed in the library guide if you want to look at that to see what's lost. And we have really not had any need to replace um, pieces, lost pieces. Generally, um, the pieces, there's enough pieces that it's still playable. We've had people put pieces in if there were pieces and we, we find how they worked around it. We had some Legos that replaced some of our pandemic blocks. So people are creative and they wanna play the game and they'll still, they'll still play it. Um, I think we've only had one game where we had to actually buy some extra pieces to make it playable over the last 10 years. So it's just different. It's not difficult. So don't overthink how to, to make it work because it does work. So just do that. And the same thing with consoles, circulating consoles. The records are out there. 
we barcode all our pieces so they, they we know they come back it's like 10 at the most 10 item records which yes you have to scan them but um, our front desk staff has learned how to do it and it's not been a huge obstacle so don't overthink your circulation requirements um we do certain things in a bag i think the biggest loss issue that we worried about too was things just falling open in people's cars um, many a dvd has been lost under someone's seat for a year and then it comes back so just making sure everything if it did fall open it falls open in the bag so that's the biggest thing if anything you take away from this is don't overthink your circulation requirements okay an assessment so when we think about assessment um you want people to know how great your collection is that people are checking it out so again you want to catalog it you don't want the lack of a catalog record to slow down your ability to, to count how many times it circulates. So definitely check those in and out. You'll have a circulation count that'll help you say, this game went out 25 times last year. We need a second copy or look, the collection's working. We also count the number of people at all of our events. So you definitely wanna know who's coming, what are they doing, are they having fun? So just keep, keep track of that. And you can actually survey them a little more if you wanna find out more from them. But so far we've found success in just knowing these people have come and we're lucky at the University of North Texas that they card swipe and we can actually grab a bunch of demographic data from just counting participants so we can see the number but we can also see who these who these people are demographically. Um, who's using the collection so we do keep track who are the student groups that are using your collection so we'll have sororities and fraternities and student orgs using the collection and we do give them some extra privileges to use the collection so it becomes uh, a space they want to come use the space, they want to come use the collections and it saves them having to purchase um, materials for their events, they can just come check it out. So we give them booking privileges so they can take things on specific, specific dates and, and use that. So we do keep a, a list of those student groups and we keep a list of faculty that use games in classes. So we know who's using games to teach in classes, we know who's checking out games to use in their classes and beyond our collection and the use of our collection, we know who's using games to teach on campus, even if they're not using our games, because then that gives us an idea of what we might support. We can show that, yes, this is a collection that might need support, that might be more used in the future. It's a selling point when they're hiring faculty if they decide to do game design programs. So just thinking broadly about your collection and where it fits on campus. And again, having those, having that information, it's good to have because every now and then I get asked, do you have that document with all the faculty teaching games? Someone needs to see it. I have it um, and we just update it once a year and we can hand it off to someone. Do you have that list of student groups that use games? And it, it's just helpful to have it on hand because it shows you're on you're on top of your collection, you know who's using it, you know how it should be used and, and you're being a, um, a steward of that money for this collection. You're being a steward of the collection and you're, and you're doing a good job of making sure this collection really is a valuable collection and, being, and belongs on your campus and in your library. So I'm going to hand off to Stuart. I talk real fast, so I <laughs> went quickly, but he's going to talk more about um, how we engage and encourage play. Hi. Uh, yes. Yeah, so as Diane mentioned, um, I'm Stuart Heath, the Games and Outreach Coordinator at the UNT Media Library. Um, and Diane touched on a few of these topics already, but uh, one really, really important important factor of maintaining this collection and maintaining the um, gaming community on campus is the ability to establish the third place um, for students patrons um, and that we provide a space and an environment outside of a student's home and outside of a student's classroom. So not only is it great that we have this collection, but one thing that I've seen that's just been really, really great and students really, really enjoy is that we do have the gaming space in the library where students can reserve um, gaming stations and they can actually access the collection that we have in the library and play the games in-house or, or take them out, of course, too. Um, this is especially great for a lot of students who live on campus and, and may not have a lot of the um, hardware that that we might require to play a lot of newer games that are coming out or even the hardware that it requires to play older games. Um, so one thing that we do to really maintain engagement with our patrons and our students is just the element of community development. Um, really making sure that everybody is heard and everybody feels comfortable in the space and um, by 
it, it, there's pl plenty of ways to develop your gaming community and to allow for your students to feel safe and comfortable. But one thing that might seem like a, a, a simple answer is just to have a really strong knowledge of your collection. So to be aware of, of the games that you have available, to be aware of the games that are being played, the games that used to be played, and to be able to talk on your collection and to be able to connect with and engage with your patrons and students will not only continue to support your collection and to continue to allow games to be notable and, 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 and relevant, but then to also show that um, you're, you're a part of this with them too, and that you are as passionate about the games that they're playing in the space. Um, outside of building a knowledge of the collection, we also facilitate plenty of activities. We have um, a, a breadth of gaming events. We have an open um, gaming event once a month called Game On, where we take down the reservation restrictions on all of our consoles and all of our gaming stations, and um, students come in and just play to you know to the hearts 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 uh, desires. And we typically have a restriction of four hours per day um, per patron. So days like these are also pretty great because students can play for the entirety of the event and jump from console to console without making reservations. And outside of those open gaming events, we also do host a variety of other activities, um, like Diane mentioned, like escape rooms and, and things of that sort. So in, in that vein, it's just really important to make sure that everybody feels safe and welcome, um, especially with games and gaming. Uh, as Diane pointed out earlier with, with the statistics, there's such a wide variety of gamers. And nowadays, especially in, in, um, you know, considering mobile gaming, more folks are gamers than they may even know. They may not even realize that they play games just because games come in so many different shapes and forms. So it's really important to establish and support an environment where every single type of gamer feels welcome in that space. And that could be difficult because it's games and, and people like one thing and other people like other things. But um, one thing to consider is that it's just a matter of providing an element of oversight and and especially when it comes to managing a game space, you really want to be sure that everybody is also, that, that students and patrons are also supporting a welcoming environment to others while also not trying to play the role of fun police. So one thing we encounter, of course, is, is noise management. And um, we do have audio turned off on the external devices, but that students can access through headphones. So just little things like making sure that nobody's being so loud in one station that others don't feel comfortable at another station and that having a balance between supporting the department and our library while also supporting the needs and desires and, and um, aspirations of, of our patrons and our students. So there is a fine line, but it's definitely doable. It, it, it sounds more difficult than it is. Um, honestly, it's a blast getting to uh, connect with students. And, and again, everybody in our library are a bunch of big nerds and gamers ourselves. So it's, it's really a lot of fun. If you wanna to go to the next one. There we go. Um, so going off of our uh, physical spaces, we did actually have to make quite a big transition um, with the pandemic in 2020. And one thing that we were really, really fortunate to be able to do was to start to provide and support a digital space while students were lacking that physical space, which a lot of our patrons really grew accustomed to. Um, so we did see a, uh, a stark kind of contrast whenever we no longer had our regulars, we no longer had patrons coming in. I mean, um, again, it was, it was a really, really great space for our, a lot of our students and patrons to feel comfortable and at home. So one difference in transition we tried to make was to be able to provide a digital space in lieu of our um, physical space. And of course, social media presences are great for that sort of um, environment. But something that we found a lot of success in was actually having a Discord server for a lot of our patrons and our UNT gaming community to, to, to join, to chat with students, to chat with faculty and staff, talk about the games in our collection. Um, and I think in our first couple months of having a Discord server, we spiked up 500 plus students and, and we've just been getting hundreds ever since. And um, this has been really great because we're able to maintain a digital environment while we're lacking a physical environment. And this actually supports a lot of students and gamers who truthfully feel even more comfortable online and feel like they can really engage with others without having to be in person, which um, again, many of us gamers um, really, really thrive in the online environment. Now, 
we do hope to return, of course, to the in-person environment as soon as safely possible. And when we do that, I, I believe that we're going to try to support a hybrid now that we have the Discord server and we have we will have the in-person space again, so that we can support all patrons and all students again to where everybody has a space that they feel comfortable, whether it be in our in-person events or our online events. And speaking of our online events, um, in, in, while everything has been closed and we have been able to offer our giant gaming events where we have hundreds of students packed into a very small space, we have transitioned to virtual programming and we've moved our online gaming event like Game On to our Discord server where we still just play over, over voice comms and everything like that. But we've also developed some virtual programs through our Twitch, our Twitch channel, um, such as one where our student employees will play D&D on Twitch and we'll have uh, patrons in the UNT gaming community and the Twitch stream um, in the chat, like making suggestions, talking about the gameplay, talking about the characters and the narratives. And um, this has been really, really great for engaging with students outside of the physical environment. And it's also really been great to highlight our collection and materials and to show students through our Twitch stream, here are some of the games we have. Um, you could check them out at the media library or, or even we've moved um, uh, a lot of uh, just even talking about the role, role playing games like D&D and, and the different books we have available for students with the, to support their role playing needs. So outside of gaming events and outside of supporting the uh, physical gameplay, we also really have found that there is a very important aspect of outreach and networking, which is um, a lot of what I've done with the library in that um, it's important to promote the collection, to let people know that you you exist and that you have these wonderful resources and you have these games available, whether that be to promoting it to um, game developers or third party companies, or even promoting it just to different departments on campus. As Diane mentioned, um, you can only get student groups and professors and faculty using your collection if they know that it, it exists. So um, we found that it's really important to make sure that you get the word out there just so that um, everybody knows these resources are available to them for whether it be academic purposes or just recreational purposes. Um, it's also really helpful if you uh, chat with games industry and, and local developers, whether indie companies or AAA companies for a matter of acquiring donations. Um, there's a lot of developers, no matter how big or how small that are really interested in getting their new games in the hands of students. So. Um, we found that even um, tabletop companies will want to sometimes donate minis and we'll have painting events and, and things of that nature. Um, making these connections and building these relationships just serves really, really well to maintain the, the, the longevity of your collection and to continue to build partnerships of that nature. Um, it also allows the presence of the games industry in an academic setting. So even at UNT, there's now a game studies and design program being developed. And it's been really great to be able to get games in the hands of professors and um, any instructors that might be teaching with these games or teaching about these games. And then outside of that, going back to the games industry, bringing folks in from the industry to have talks, to have information sessions or panels is really great because it is able to highlight the careers and opportunities for students and for patrons that are in the games industry, as we see it's such a big growing industry and there's so many opportunities there that it's a really good chance to show just everybody that game developers are people too. They, they exist, they, there are people behind these wonderful games that we've all grown to love. And I think that it's been a great opportunity to show everybody that, um, that they can do it too, that if they love games, they can make games or they can, they can explore games, they can study games. So. Uh, we've just found that getting our collection in the hands of others and spreading the awareness and knowledge of our collection has been really, really helpful for supporting it and, and growing it over time. And that's us, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Here's some resource and resources and links. Um, so the League of Librarian Gamers um, is a great group to join. Um, I guess I should start at the top, which is we have a library guide is specifically for librarians wanting to start collections and it has a lot more details about how it quickly went through everything so it has more details and it has pictures and examples and information um, more specific to each each part of the thing that I talked about and even some stuff that Sturt's talked about um, showing our space um, some of our ads that we use to promote our events but you want to know board game geek was a great site if you didn't know about it already it's a it's a good site to go to for information about board games and then the legal librarian gamers is a Facebook group um, really, really active group right now. It is sort of public library focused, 
um, but they will answer any questions. So there's a lot of um, people on there that can be really helpful as you start. M more board game and um, console game than PC game um, on that site. It's still a lot of really great people. And then there's the Entertainment Software Association. So um, they do have good information. They are um, the software association. So <laughs> their information will be geared more to what their industry needs, but it's also good information regardless. And then there's our emails. So you are welcome to email us at any time. Um, we will answer any questions that you have about the collection and how we use it and any specific questions as well. And that's pretty much all we have. And then we are open for questions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so here it I is am such a live. trip seeing you and like seeing the recorded you <laughs> and you look exactly the same. <laughs> I, I do. I do regret not including some sort of interaction with myself. I only thought of it, thought of it afterward. I should like give myself a high five. I've been like back to you, Stuart. Like, Thank you, Stuart. Um, <laughs> back to Stuart in the studio. Um, <laughs> so yeah, now we're with the live Stuart. So if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat or you can also unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you wish. I'm just now looking at the chat too. So I see in the chat that somebody had asked how the pandemic had affected escape rooms and breakouts. I can, um, I can definitely uh, uh, speak to that a little bit. Um, a lot. <laughs> so uh, yes, very much so. Our, our escape rooms are 100% in person. So we have been unable to host any escape rooms for the past year. Um, we, ha we were actually in the process of developing new escape rooms at that time. So we have been able, we've been fortunate enough to be able to continue those projects and continue moving them forward and to, uh, continue developing different narratives and scenarios. Um, it is a lot more difficult when we're all remote and we're not like tinkering together and working on, on puzzles and projects in person. Um, however, we did, uh, actually, um, find success in developing digital breakouts. So a lot of our breakouts are tabletop breakouts and we do have a lot of our puzzles and things that are very much still in person and, and things that you have to kind of handle. And, and it's, it is of course difficult to circulate materials that are um, being so closely, uh, you know, passed around and handled, but the digital breakouts worked out really, really well. Um, we ended up developing some different uh, training modules for the uh, campus RAs. And we ended up making training somewhat gamified by uh, by having the training process in a version of a breakout. And those actually worked a lot better than um, one might think. We were able to utilize some free software um, to create like visual novels that kind of like served as a breakout of sorts. Um, and yeah, so in, in some senses, it, they were really greatly affected in that we aren't currently able to host our in-person escape rooms. Um, but the digital breakouts, we did find a lot of success for. We, we, we did see that there was a few different companies and institutions that were hosting online escape rooms where they would have them via webcam and somebody would be in the room while people would be instructing them via live chat and helping them um, go through. And they would like unlock something as somebody would type in like, go unlock this. Like it was somewhat of like a simulation. Uh, we never explored that um, as of yet. We didn't quite have the uh, the time or the resources to do so, but um, but yeah. So they they were greatly affected. But we're really really excited to to get to return to um, our escape rooms and breakouts whenever it's safe to do so. Um, so I see the the question about the Discord beeping. I think that that was ours. The the the, the Discord, the media library Discord that we were um, talking about during the presentation um, is very successful and has a lot of people engaging in it. But unfortunately, I think it may have been uh, booping while we were while we were talking. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. If there's a, I don't see, unless I missed a question in the chat. Let's see. I think my Discord even just booped a second ago. I apologize for that, everyone. Um, are there any other questions in the chat or anything I may have missed? Anything that anyone has any questions about? Um, always happy to talk about games. 
just a reminder that you can unmute yourself and uh, turn on your camera if you wish, or you can put your question in the chat. What is my favorite thing about this subject? I see Catherine has asked in the um, in the chat about the subject as in about games or games in an academic setting, games, um, like gaming collections. If no specifics, uh, okay, games and game collections and academic settings. Um, oh, I wish we had all day. <laughs> um, I, I personally have been an avid gamer since um, as long as I have memory. Um, the majority of my life, the games have always been a really important part of a part of everything I do. And um, personally, I think one of the many things that are my favorite thing about games and game collections and academic settings is just really getting the opportunity to put games and this form of media into the hands of everybody. Um, I think that uh, accessibility and availability are incredibly, incredibly important, important, especially whenever it comes to information dissemination. And um, the fact that we're able to have uh, just this huge variety of games. I think we, I want to say we have like 4,000 video games, 800 tabletop games. I might even be giving you guys smaller numbers at this point, but we have such a wide variety and um, being the games outreach coordinator, I had a lot of uh, contact and consistent communication with the students in the space. And it was just always great to see students talking about games they love, but then also discussing games they had never played before and getting the opportunity to check out games and play them um, without having, you know, I mean, as most things are every day, games are expensive. So it was a really great opportunity to see students getting to try things and um, explore new stories and play games they maybe never would have played because again, it's hard to shell out 60 plus dollars for a new game every time it comes out. Not to say that games aren't worth that amount, but they, they very much are. I mean, I'd argue that they're worth way more than that, but um, it's really great to see the, the fact that we're able to get all of this information into everybody's hands um, and then just Games in an academic setting, um, I think that, I mean, I, I know there's a lot of discourse on the subject, but I'm a very big one to argue that games are so very much art. So as much as, you know, as long as we can continue to explore that and people can continue to study that and um, uh, to, what is it, to quote uh, Arrested Development, like we demand to be taken seriously, like to also to destigmatize games. Um, Cause you know, if we, there's always the, the discussion and discourse around whether or not games are good for people, um, which to me is just you know mind-boggling because it, it, it's the same as if like our, our movie is good for people. It's, it's art, right? So I think um, just to be able to support uh, availability and to be sure to be able to get things into the world's hands is is one thing that I especially love about games collections and academic settings. Also, I I'm just a big nerd and. Um, I love workshopping. I love talking to people about stuff. So getting to be in that environment and really getting to talk to people about games all the time for a living is as a treat, to be honest. <laughs>